21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. You dedicated the book to your grandfather, Pope, and you wrote who came to America from Ireland with a dream for a better life, uh, etc. So uh, is there a, a connection with your grandfather, uh, some kind of influence? Uh, is he responsible for you being entrepreneur today? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say there's a lot of ripples, right? Kind of the ripple effect. So if, if my grandfather didn't immigrate from Ireland to New York, um, then my mom would never have met my dad. And my dad is an entrepreneur, so that probably would have never happened. But you know, my, my grandfather was uh, an engineer, and he helped build a lot of uh, different sets and churches throughout New York. Wow. So, so just growing up, uh, you know, my parents, they'd always influence me to build things. And I would say that if my grandfather wasn't doing that, let's say he's doing marketing or business or something else, um, then I probably wouldn't have had that influence in my life. Wow, that sounds great. So basically, when you go to some church in, in New York, uh, you, you could, you could uh, touch something that your grandfather actually did. Yeah, like, like when I was younger, we'd go to New York and uh, the St. Patrick's Cathedral my grandfather, uh, he was in charge of installing all the doors and maintaining uh, where all the like different priests live. And uh, I remember when I think I was five or six years old, there was all these different secret passageways. Where really? You, yeah, like, like under a lot of the churches connecting them. Oh, really? So, Even yeah. today? So you can go Even from today. church to church uh, through a secret passage? Exactly. So he'd show me how to get to all those, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. That's really cool. And those doors are actually still there, so it's you can you can touch the door, and as you are part of your grandfather history. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, my mom always says that he did such a good job on those doors that they probably won't replace <laughs> him for a long time. So yeah, his, his memory will always uh, be there. When you start with with uh, entrepreneurship. When you, when you get the idea, did, it was, a, was it a feeling? Was it uh, necessary for some reason for you? Why? I mean, when and why? Yes. So, I mean, growing up in Boston, uh, it, it's like a very, I'd say, athletic community. So I always partook in a lot of different sports. Like every season, most uh, kids at the time, you know, they play maybe soccer. I would do soccer, lacrosse, baseball. I'd, I was consistently busy and I think just kind of taking that mental state. Uh, my dad, he was going through the process of selling his company and had more time. And I think when you, as a father, when you think about, you know, how do I want my son to be? Uh, for myself, I, you know, I'm, I want my kids to be um, action sports lovers and active and appreciate the outdoors. For my dad, he wanted me to be an athlete and also to be an entrepreneur. So every single summer we'd write business plans together and then we'd actually go compete in business playing contests all throughout the Boston area. So they, I'd always go in and they'd tell me we'd outside and my dad would say, no, actually, my son's the one who's participating in the contest. Uh -huh. I, I was maybe, I don't know, like 12, 13, 14, and everyone else is like 35 to age 50. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, yeah, so definitely started at it like a young age. Maybe today age is not so, so important as before. What do you think? No, I don't think so. I mean, they say that basically your brain matures up to age 27, um, right? But I think it's all about experience. So I've, I've talked to a lot of people where they say, you know, either I could hire someone who has six to seven to eight years of real world experience, or I could hire someone during that time who went to, let's say, undergraduate, MBA, master's, PhD. They said any day I'd want to go for the person with real world experience. But actually, there is one difference between uh, younger and older entrepreneurs. So basically, when you become older, having been kicked for several years, both people become more circumspect, alert, less willing to, to go into flow, to reach that tipping point, to immerse into the transformation that they need to immerse into if they want to become successful entrepreneurs so what about i mean do do you have do you have fear 
Are you um, are you fearless, or do you, do you have uh, some percentage of fear, or do do you feel do you feel you have less fear than than older entrepreneurs that you met? I, I'd say so. Like, I think fear is an acronym for you know false expectations appearing real. So I kind of look at it and I say, if I can know what those expectations are, and I make sure that this is the reality, then I'm not afraid to go to the next step. Uh, so I'd say maybe the difference between myself and someone who is older is that maybe they've been burned before. Um, so that they have this reality of, you know, my expectations are that this could be a bad outcome. Maybe they didn't have a positive outcome. Uh, when I was competing in snowboarding when I was younger, all of my friends who would be, one of my friends actually won the Olympics um, wow. in, in the last winter Olympics. And the difference between him and me was I'd always think, you know, what if I fall? Because I had a pretty bad crash one year. He was always thinking, what if I land? Uh -huh. and he was always landing all these different uh, tricks. So for myself, uh, I try to push myself to the point where I don't, let's say, burn myself too much. So like with flow state, they say, you know, you don't push yourself, um, let's say from zero to one, you know, let's say where your comfort zone is, maybe it's 70% of the way. And you say, okay, I want to expand my comfort zone to 80%. So now I'm going to push to 75. So it's still not out of control. So I'm not scared to go forward. So I think, uh, you know, with fear, it's basically every single day you have like one step you take forward until you're at that 100% change. And a lot of people, they either may have went from zero to one too fast and they got burned and said, you know, I'm not doing it or they never push their comfort zone. So they still have this layer of fear that's like inhibiting what they're doing. Um, so I'd say, yeah, it's a combination of being young. It's a combination of seeing other young people doing things that in the past used to be thought of, this is crazy, what are they doing? And now it seems more the norm. So our comfort zone is larger. And I'd say, um, you know, we're validating what those expectations are sooner. And therefore, fear is not as much of a reality. To make your comfort zone larger, are there any steps or way of thinking of, or way of problem solving? What do you think? Yeah, I think there definitely is. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, so one of my friends, he's a professional big wave surfer. And he actually, he consults in, in flow state for like corporate executives. And he uses this uh, example all the time. So uh, there's a wave in California, it's called Mavericks. And it's the biggest wave um, in California. There's a movie with Gerard Butler uh, that they made about it. Ah, that one. So it's, yeah. a, it's a pretty big wave. <laughs> it's a big wave. It, it breaks oh, okay. two to three times a year. Uh, uh -huh. and, when, and when it breaks, they have this contest called the Mavericks Invitational, where all the best surfers from all over the world, they fly out for this one day. And um, this wave, it's treacherous. If you crash in the wrong area, it can suck you down all the way to the bottom. And if you hit the rocks, there's been some of the best big wave surfers in the world die on it just because they were so confident and they had never really been, let's say burned in the past. They said, I'm going to go for this. So with my friend, he was kind of timid and it took him about three to four years to get out to the wave. So every single time he'd paddle out until he got a little bit too scared, he'd go back and he'd paddle out. He says, okay, here's the point I was at last time. I pushed himself a little bit more until he's out there with the other surfers sitting next to the wave. Then the next time he's paddling, let's say in front of the wave, then the next time he's standing up in a smaller wave until the point he's surfing at Mavericks Invitational. So I think it's all about understanding. Okay. You got to look at your mindset and at least for, for flow state, um, it's this sense of being where you're in the moment. You're not thinking about anything else. Your body takes over. Uh, your brain waves are actually in a state between alpha and theta uh, called the Delta zone where uh, you're actually in a state of meditation. However, you're active. So I'd say for business, if you're going to apply that, um, with my sales team, I'd always apply that. I'd ask them, okay, have you done sales in the past? Have you done cold calling? Have you done client meetings? And if they hadn't, I'd say, okay, rather than doing, let's say 50 cold calls today to executives, we're going to start with 10 to managers. Tomorrow, we're going to do 32 directors. And eventually, you work their way up. So you basically help others to achieve their goals. You're not only developing your, your, your business, but you're helping others, if I understood you well. Yeah, so, so, so what I mean is, uh, at least for my business, I had a team. 
And I wanted to make sure that I eliminated fear from the equation that I enabled my team to get into flow state as often as possible. And if they're in flow state, they're enjoying what they're doing and they're pushing their boundaries. Uh, so I kind of used the methodology that I use and I helped apply it to my team. And I believe that gave us a good competitive advantage within our market. What do you need to, to get into that kind of flow state? Do you need some level of awareness? Do you need some level of contact with yourself? Do you need some way of, of thinking? Is there a process? Yeah, so I, I think there, there's a few different ways. And there's been a few different books that kind of you know, argue different ways to get into it. Like uh, there's this one book called The Rise of Superman by uh, Stephen Kotler. And I, I think it's fantastic. It's more um, a sports mindset, but and not as much science, but there's some science behind it. And um, yeah, the, the way I look at it is first, there's one thing you can do. There's actually this book called Designing Your Life. And it's mm -hmm. not really just on flow state, but uh, you record all the actions that you do throughout the day. And from a ranking of one to 10, you see how energized you are. And then after, let's say two, three months, you start looking at it and you identify all these trends of, okay, here are the activities that uh, reduce my energy, right? Here are mm -hmm. all the energies that are all the activities that make me feel positive. And eventually you get to a point where you try to do just as many positive activities as possible. And I believe in flow state, if you're working, if it's something that you love to do, that you're enjoying, um, it's almost like when you're riding a bike and you forget, or running, and you forget that you're riding your bike, you forget that you're running, next thing you know, you've gone three to four miles. However, your body took over and you were in the zone. For myself, I believe when I'm doing, let's say, uh, snowboarding or mountain biking, they say that when your stress levels increase, and then they drop back down immediately. That's another way to get you into flow state because your brain's releasing dopamine, serotonin. Um, if you're working, probably not as much. It's a little bit slower. Uh, so I'd say yeah, in sports, it's more abrupt, like, well, you're in flow state immediately. Uh, if you're working, if you're a classical musician, it might be the fact that you have this memory of something this is I love to do and therefore creates me ha makes me happy and therefore I have this serotonin release. And then from there, your body can take over and your brain's almost like in this, uh, you know, this dream state. You're not awake, you're not asleep, you're just doing the present, you're living in the now. So flow state, it's, it's not just dreaming, it's something else as well, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think it's things you're... So it's you're, a combination of... Yeah, they, they say uh, it, it's basically that this delta brainwave, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, they say it's the same state that you have when, when you're meditating, but... Um, but you yeah. are aware of, of, of your surrounding and yourself and what you are doing. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's almost, uh, it's like complete heightened awareness where there was a movie called Limitless and they, you know, they, the concept was that you only access, let's say 10 to 15% of your brain. However, when you take this pill, you access 100%. And, and imagine what you could do. So I would say this is a natural way to, you know, optimize your ability um, and to use as much as your brain power as possible. Did you ever saw entrepreneur that is frozen in its fear? And if you did, or if you will see one, if that will be your colleague or your friend, what would you say to that person? I think you basically, once again, you got to get people out of their comfort zone. So mm -hmm. if they're in their comfort zone all the time, they're probably not in flow as much because they're, they're not pushing their life or their work to the next step. So if someone's an introvert, a lot of times if you get them to go public speak, and do something that's like an extroverted activity that will get them into flow state because once again they're stressed out they're scared but then they realize hey this isn't that bad i can do this and then the reverse if someone is an extrovert um you know get them to do let's say some introverted activities where it might be harder for them to get into it however then once they start let's say reading or if they start doing some mathematical equations you realize wow, it's actually something I enjoy. And like, I have a lot of friends who are very, very extroverted, who are designers, and they never really saw that connection. And then when they went to design, they'd get into flow state, and I would call them up and say, hey, are you available to meet? And next thing you know, it'd be five hours later, say, hey, sorry, I got stuck in this amazing zone. Um, I just created all these different user interfaces, or I just finished all these posters. Um, but you know, they're really able to tap into your creativity as an extroverted person and leverage that in a different way. K, 
can you imagine how much people are too stressed, too stick? It's like like if you want to go to have some boxing can you imagine being so stick i'm in boxing when i have time and uh so it's, it's just for my health and uh when you are boxing with a individual that is too stick that's very good for you he, he's not flexible he's he's not in the field he's not in the flow and so much people still are going to their daily work or even start their entrepreneurship journey so stick you know like and and you you spoke about all kinds of sports you, you uh can you do any sport with with that attitude being so stick being not flexible i think you cannot you, no, you need I, you need yeah. some kind of flexibility. You need to to have some some flow, don't you? Yeah, I, I mean, physically, I'm not flexible at all. Um, but I, I mean, I, I okay, not no, physically, I, but I, I, I know <laughs> mentally. Yeah, I know. mentally. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think it applies to anything, right? Um, yeah. You, you can't be afraid to learn something new, and I think it's it's magical when you learn something new because you're adding a new skill set, you're adding new lessons to your mind that you never even had or experienced in the past. And I think if you take that same mindset to anything and you're flexible, then completely. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who they are rigid because they might have the wrong morning routine, right? I think it's very important to get enough sleep. It's important to work out enough. Um, it's important to eat the right food. And I think a lot of people, you know, they have the wrong diet. They don't sleep enough. They're tired all the time. They get into this really bad routine. And then their brain, it's, it, they're not having enough serotonin um they're not let's say having the right mental state they may be stuck in these low frequency waves where you're not excited you don't feel happy uh, your job seems monotonous uh you know you're blaming your boss at work rather than you got to ask yourself you know why are you doing this job um what do you enjoy about it and you say well maybe i'm doing it to change this industry or i'm doing it to connect with these individuals and say okay you know your boss is basically just someone in the way like or he's someone that you're working with you're still doing something that follows what you want to do in your mission. Uh, so yeah, completely like for myself, I make sure that, you know, I get at least eight hours sleep a night. I, I make sure that at least for my diet, I do like high fats. Um, so in the morning I try to do high fats. If it's like, let's say avocado or bacon. And if I can't do that and I don't have enough time, I'll make a smoothie. If I don't have that, then I'll basically skip breakfast. And I'll do like a, a quick fast until 12 o'clock. Um, and I also make sure a lot of people have caffeine in the morning, right? They'll have caffeine the second they wake up. That's not good. Um, your body can't really process it at that time. And then empty stomach. You and you empty, yeah. empty stomach. So I usually have caffeine around like 11 o'clock. Um, there's also a lot of people drink coffee. Coffee, it's healthy for you. However, you can add like L-theanine, which makes sure that you don't crash. So like a lot of people drink matcha. Uh, which has a lot of L-theanine in it. You know, it's in between, let's say, a low teen, a coffee state when it comes to caffeine. So just simple things like that, changing, I'd say, the way you wake up every morning and making sure that you're hydrated can help you get into the right mental state, which therefore unlock your flow state during the day. So Brian, can you tell us uh, more about your book? Yeah, so um, in 2013... I ended up leaving college to uh, start my company, Looped, and I was 19, 20 years old. Uh, I didn't really know what I was doing, and I was failing along the way. So the one thing that I did, which I've kind of learned in the past when I'm learning sports, is I looked for other people who, in different areas, were either 6, 12, or 18 months ahead of me, and I received a lot of amazing advice. Um, however, I wish I knew all these secrets beforehand. So after selling my company three years later, I ended up spending the next two years taking all of my conversations that I had, documents, emails, and I distilled them into 50 short stories of advice that I wish I had when starting my company. And essentially my book, it's uh, around like 320 pages, but it's not designed to read from front to back. Uh, it's similar to Tim Ferriss' Tools of Titans where you can open it up. And oh, that's a beautiful book. Tools yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. I will not even call it a book. Awesome like, book. I it's it's it a, not a book, yeah. yeah. yeah but, like, my book's not really a book either. It's in a book format. Uh, it's more like a series of like... Sim, sim, similar philosophy, similar approach in writing, yeah. 
Yeah. So you can like, if you have an issue with marketing, right? So the whole mm-hmm. entire idea is like, I have a lot of friends like I'm having issues fundraising right now, or I'm having issues with design or sales. And they can basically go to this chapter and they can find a similar problem that I had, which can mm-hmm. apply to them. And then I say, if I was in that situation, here's the style that I would have done. And here's how it worked out for me. And then they can kind of use it as a launch pad to then yeah, once again, remove the fear because I'm saying, Hey, here are your expectations. When I did it, this would happen to me. And they say, okay, that's one of the outcomes. Now, you know, I'm willing to take that next step. Maybe if you can tell us more about how you develop yourself. Did you did you just read books? Uh, did you uh, did you have some mentors? Yeah, for myself, at least when I first started my company, uh, I think I read a book like every two days. Um, I read every single business book that I get my hands on because once again, I didn't really know anything, and the only way to learn was either to read or talk to people. And I would. One one of my main investors uh, is this guy, Tim Draper, who's a a big venture capitalist and he's very connected. So he would introduce me to different advisors. So, and investors. So I said, for example, you know, I need help in the sales world. Uh, So he introduced me to Mark Benioff, who's uh, the founder and CEO of Salesforce. And he then became one of my advisors and investors. So for example, I thought I was doing really well when I first started and I said, Hey Mark, you know, I'm doing a, I have a hundred thousand dollar new pipeline this month. And for me, not knowing if that's good or bad, and I thought it was a lot of money, usually a pipeline only converts, let's say 10%. So he's saying, that's awful. That's only $10,000 in revenue. You guys should be doing way more, you know, go for a million dollar pipeline every single month. So yeah, by reading books and to talking to different people, I was able to get this knowledge. And then I'd say another big thing is too, that a lot of people, they're afraid to, start a company a lot. I have a lot of uh, friends and um, I also hear other podcasts where people feel like they need to raise money before starting something. And that's not true at all. Um, The big thing now that I'm really for is the code free revolution. So you don't necessarily need to hire developers to validate your concepts. There's a lot of tools out there. So you can design user interfaces on sketch and then you can tie them together with keynote and you can then actually create it um, online if a, a product called Bubble, where it's for essentially non-technical people. In order to design it, you can pull in different data. You can make a working model where you can start testing and validating a product within a few weeks. And then let's say you get to the point where you're saying, okay, this is validated. I need to go fast. Um, there's other competitors who are out there. Now it might make sense to fundraise. And the fact that you've been talking to advisors, they've been seeing your progress, Now they say, okay, I believe in this. I see where it's going. Sure, I'll put money into it. But a lot of people hear this story of, okay, you go to Silicon Valley or New York or Austin or you're going to Berlin and you basically come up with this amazing idea and you run into someone, they give you a few million dollars like, and they're saying, well, how does that happen? And it's one of those things where it really, it doesn't happen overnight. And the way to make it happen is to basically validate, okay, here's the problem that I'm solving. Here's the job to be done. And let's start building it. And once, and the one thing I learned is I thought that if you validate something, let's let's say 10 to 20 people is going to be much different for 1000 or 2000 people. And it's really not. So as long as you can create a good experience, that's consistent for 10 to 20 people. And now you basically either raise money or you make revenue to scale it to the thousands. It's very possible. And it's also another way to make sure that you're in the zone the entire time because you're taking baby steps until you went from zero to one. I personally was really interested in industrial design. So designing products. And when I first went to San Francisco, I looked for all the top designers that worked in similar wearable tech products. And I reached out to all of them. So first of all, I made sure I wasn't afraid to reach out to them. Step one, Uh, this one guy, Bill Webb, who is the designer for the GoPro and the Nike field band, he reached out to me, he said, come on by. And it was actually perfect timing because all of his other uh, designer friends were either teaching at local universities or mentoring others. And he wasn't, and they were all giving them crap for it. So 
uh, he said, you know, I'd love to mentor you. And once a week, I'd go up into his studio, I'd show him my designs, and he would say, well, you know what, you need to add a curve here, it needs to be bigger here, you need to basically take into consideration different wrist sizes. And I didn't necessarily know how to do all of that in SolidWorks, which is a, a 3D computer animated design software. So what I would do is I would go to Udemy and Khan Academy and these online courses in order to learn those skills. And then the, the next week I would show them, hey, I applied these changes to the design. So I combined uh, you know, my interests with an advisor with online courses in order to take it to the next step. So <clears throat> when I'm listening to you and we are speaking about really various topics, uh, your knowledge is pretty huge. Uh, when you need to introduce, do you actually do, do you have one elevator pitch? Do you have ele <laughs> elevator pitch at all? Does not have to be anything to do with business. It can be it can be your friend asking you, "Hi, Brian, what did you do for last last couple of years?" How how do you respond to that question? How do you define yourself? What do you say about yourself? Yeah, no, it, it's a good point. Um, yeah, so I'm reading this book right now called Solve for Happy, and it's from uh, the head of Google X, and he talks about how your job doesn't describe who you are, your parents don't describe who you are, you yourself is who you are. So for myself, I could say, you know, I'm, a, let's say, an adrenaline seeker, I love snowboarding, kiteboarding. Kiteboarding and snowboarding mountain bike doesn't define who I am, however, it's something that I enjoy to do. Um, when I say I'm an executive at a an event technology company. It doesn't define who I am. However, it shows that my interests are the event space. So I, I usually say that I'm passionate. The last few years, I've been passionate at making uh, technology that can bring people together, that can connect them. And in my free time, I love adventuring and action sports. And then from that, they usually say, well, okay, what's connection technology? And I talk about, well, I was making mobile apps and hardware and analytics in order to bring the right people together and I then had this vision and mission where I wanted to make events more than events. Events were a gathering. And I thought if I can combine multiple gatherings together that I can make this new, almost offline network. Um, and just kind of the fact that I talk more about my mission and my passion, that defines who I am. Because you're right, I have a lot of different interests. However, they're kind of all tied back um, to the same focus as you know, creating something new in life that connects people. And do you have any kind of plan? Do you know what will happen in the next one year, let's say in like six months, one year? Um, yeah, I, I usually do like, let's three to four months at a time. Um, so for example, uh, I'm going to move to Japan in January and I'm probably going to live there for three months. Um, and after that, then I'll probably figure out what makes the most sense. I kind of have a direction of where I want to go. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in the past, I knew that, okay, I want to be in Silicon Valley because that's where my clients were and investors and that I probably do my company for three years. And then I said, okay, I want to make sure that I, I expand my product to as many people around the world. How do I make it more global? Because we were based in the U.S. So I found a company that I partnered with who bought us. And I said, I'm probably going to do this for two to three years. And then, you know, the next chapter of my life, I'm trying to figure it out. It's like, what do I love to do? And in the past, I loved, uh, once again, bringing people together through events and traveling. Um, I also love bringing people together through their interests. Um, so I'm personally interested in the active lifestyle. Um, you know, so hiking and um, let's say going out. Um, so I'll probably focus the next, let's say, three years of my life to enabling people to travel the world and connect through active lifestyle. And uh, Japan will be kind of the first step. But yeah, it's, it's always three to four months out. I don't think you can, you don't want to stunt yourself too much. But you also, I think in, in the US, for example, if, if you leave a job every year, it looks like you're flaky. So I, I usually, before deep diving into a project, I know, okay, I'm going to do this for at least three years. Mm -hmm. uh, cause I, I don't want to keep changing my mind. I think it takes at least a year and a half to really get into something because it could be the right idea, but the wrong time. And if you're thinking ahead, a lot of times you're too early. So I'll think in a three to four month um, section. However, I know I'm doing at least this larger mission for three years. There are 
other guys uh, listening to us with multiple choices in their life. The way the world is still functioning is for you to focus on just one thing. And that's not very good approach. You need to have holistic approach. You need to have higher level of awareness. You need to be in the field, etc. So what would you tell to those people? Yeah, so for myself, I was going to school for material science and engineering. And in that field, usually you're looking at materials that are failing and recommending new materials or designing new materials. And usually in that field, what you do is you either then work at a chemical or material company, you hit a point where you can't get a higher salary, so you go back for a master's or a PhD, and then you go back into the lab or you're out in the field. And you really, it's, you're, you're doing one thing pretty much for, let's say, 20, 30, 40 years until you retire. Um, and some people like it. Yeah, I some don't people like it, but some people yeah. like it, yeah. No, but, but you could be doing, like, the example is you could be doing one thing, right? So yeah, sure. you could be doing just failure analysis the entire time. Um, a lot of people think it's, it's bad to be a generalist, right? If you're doing too many things, you're stretching yourself thin. Um, mm -hmm. what, what I like is uh, Naval Ravikant, who's the founder of AngelList, um, I was recently, he has a new podcast called Naval that came out and they have this very long episode of all of them tied together. And he said that you should think of it like when you're climbing Mount Everest, you climb Mount Everest, let's say, and then you hit a crevasse, which you can't pass. Do you basically say that's it? Or do you go back down and then you climb a different route until you get to the top? So I think as long as you know what your mission is, like my mission is connecting people. I did it through wearable tech and it got to a point where I said, you know, it didn't connect to people as much as I wanted. So I'm going to go back down the mountain and now start off a different route. And along the way, you learn a lot of these different skills. But as long as you're learning these skills in order to get to your ultimate goal, that's completely fine. So, Brian, how can we learn more about your book and how can we contact you? Yeah, so my book is on Amazon. Um, if you search takeaways, Brian Freeman will pop up. And we actually just launched our audiobook today on Audible. Uh, so if you sign up for an Audible account, you should be able to get a free credit and you can download the book. Um, my book website is takeawaysbook.com. And if you want to contact me, you can either reach out to me on my website, brianmfriedman.com, or you can reach out to me on Instagram at brianmfriedman. Beautiful, beautiful, Brian. Thank you so much. I, I think that you shared so much value with our audience. Thank you very much for being in a 21st century entrepreneurship podcast. Yeah, no, thank you. That was fun. 21st century entrepreneurship with Martin Piskorik. If you enjoyed today's show, please head over to iTunes, give us a rating and leave a review. 